Okay, so we're back with the last of the recordings dealing with the American Civil War. Um, when we left off at our last session, we were talking about some of the pretty significant changes um, that come as a result of the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862. And one of the most significant consequences of that particular battle is that Abraham Lincoln uses that as the opportunity to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And even though the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't free all of the slaves in all of the states, it only frees slaves in states in the Confederacy, um, it still has the effect of, in many ways, transforming the American Civil War into a war of freedom, right? A war that is increasingly focused around the concept of emancipation and the abolition of slavery. This has certainly a positive moral connotation, positive ethical connotation, but it doesn't have necessarily the best impact in terms of enlistments into the army, um, leading to pretty significant shortfalls, leading to the need to establish the first draft um, in American military history, and that doesn't go over terribly well either. There are a lot of Northerners that are willing to fight this war over the Union and whether the Confederacy has the right to break away from the United States, but there are a lot of Northerners that are not interested in waging a war to free um, slaves. And so enlistments drop when the um, Draft is instituted in the spring and summer of 1863. There are widespread draft riots, uh, some of the biggest happening in New York City, um, where over 100 people are killed as a result. And so into 1863, you're beginning to see um, a country that is growing more and more weary of the Civil War. It was never expected to last as long as it has, and by 1863, middle of 1863, it's over two years old. Um, it still has almost another two years to go. And so, in 1863, you have um, really the, the kind of turning point in the war's fortunes. It's still going to be a while before the Union can officially achieve victory um, overall. Um, but the events of the summer of 1863 and then into 1864 point in the direction of maybe not an inevitable Union victory, but certainly a likely Union victory. And the kind of high watermark um, of the Confederate effort during the war comes at the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is another attempt by Robert E. Lee to invade the North um, in the hopes that he's going to be able to take his army, circle around through Maryland and down sort of behind Washington, D.C., capturing the capital, or at least cutting the capital city off from the rest of, of the North. Um, Lee makes his way through Maryland all the way into Pennsylvania, South Central Pennsylvania. He has probably the largest army that he is going to have through the course of the war, um, about 74,000 soldiers. The Union Army, under a guy named George Gordon Meade, has almost 90,000 soldiers, and by sheer accident, they end up meeting at a little town in south-central Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. This is going to be the largest battle of the war. It takes three days to actually resolve. It is a Union victory, unlike Antietam, which was a little bit mm, iffy. Gettysburg is a Union victory. Lee is defeated. On July 3rd, he makes a kind of last gasp attempt at breaking through the Union lines, sort of at the center of the battlefield. And this is, if you've ever heard of Pickett's Charge, some people have, some people haven't. 
it's a, a term, at least, that might be more familiar, even if you don't know exactly what it refers to. Pickett's charge was this massive infantry charge right at the Union Center in the hopes that breaking through that position on the Union lines would end up rolling up the Union um, army and leading to the ultimate Confederate victory in the battle. It doesn't work out that way. Um, Pickett's charge fails. It's driven back. And that's really the end of the Battle of Gettysburg on, Ju on July 3rd. The next morning, Lee's army escapes. And here again, much like what happened with Antietam, the Union doesn't pursue. It's a little bit more excusable in this case than it was with Antietam. But the end result is the same. The opportunity to squash Lee's army gets away. And so Lee manages to retreat back into Virginia and maintain this, this already traumatic war for another almost two years. At the end of the Battle of Gettysburg, somewhere around one-third of the total combined forces ends up being killed or injured. So it is a really, really catastrophic battle. It does represent the furthest north that the Confederate Army ever reaches. It does represent the last time that Lee has the resources and has the sort of idea of pushing directly into northern territory. From this point forward, the war is going to be fought in Virginia and points south and west. So it does represent a turning point, even though at the time it's not immediately apparent. One of the other um, things about the Battle of Gettysburg is that it happened simultaneously with another achievement in the Western theater, and that is the capture of Vicksburg, Mississippi. And we mentioned Vicksburg, Mississippi when we talked about the Mississippi River campaign, when Admiral Farragut is moving up and down the Mississippi River, trying to gain control of that waterway, that, that really important passageway for southern um, commerce and southern movement of materials and soldiers. Vicksburg is this holdout, right? Vicksburg is a fortified city that overlooks the river. And as long as the Confederacy controls Vicksburg, it is still going to have some limited access to the Mississippi River until basically on the same day as the end of the Battle of Gettysburg, July 3rd, Grant manages to capture Vicksburg once and for all. It has taken six weeks of siege warfare, right, where you basically kind of surround your enemy and then just wait them out. You just prevent them from getting food or water or... Uh, resupplied for ammunition or clothing or bandages or medicine or any of that. So it takes six weeks of siege warfare in order to finally achieve this victory at Vicksburg. And so between those two events at the beginning of July in 1863, that really is going to be um, two pretty significant kinds of, of turning points that will point ultimately in the direction of a Union victory. And so over time, what you start to see is the northern armies are gradually squeezing deeper and deeper and deeper into the Confederate territory. And so the map here gives you a sense of some of the areas that the Confederacy loses um, as a result of different Union advances. And so <clears throat> by 1865, the year that the war ends, there are big, big tracts of uh, Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and Arkansas that are now under Union control. Maybe more importantly, by 1865, Virginia is being compressed deeper and deeper and deeper. And so since Virginia is the sort of um, leader of the Confederacy, that's where the capital of the Confederacy is, that's where... Robert E. Lee is from, that's where a number of the, the prominent Confederate generals come from. Losing ground in Virginia is a significant problem for the Confederacy. In addition, 
as we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, other Union armies are pushing down through Georgia, making their way to the Atlantic Ocean, kind of splitting the Confederacy into pieces as they go. And so the war really is a process of compression and, and occupation, but it's still going to take until April of 1865 before the Confederate Army will officially surrender. Um, and so there's still a lot that has to happen in the meantime. One of those things is the arrival of General Ulysses S. Grant into the leadership of the overall Union war effort. And Grant begins the war as kind of a nobody in the West. He achieves some successes. Um, he is not one to really kind of play the political game. And in the 1860s, that's very much one of the responsibilities of especially higher level officers um, in the U.S. military. Grant is not one of those people. So he really often gets overlooked um, for high level command, staff level command. He does manage to have some success in the West. He has some failures in the West. Grant is also um, a little ahead of his time in his understanding of the way that modern warfare will, um, will proceed, right? Grant is the first Union commander to recognize the way to make the most advantage of the Union strengths. In other words, the larger population, the larger manufacturing, better transportation, better communication, better infrastructure, um, better financial infrastructure, and better diplomatic connections with other parts of the world, right? And Grant recognizes that you have to make use of all of these things combined in order to defeat your enemy. So he's one of the early proponents of what's called total war, where war isn't just a matter of one army on the battlefield fighting another army. War involves wiping out the other side's ability to wage war. So that includes destroying their food, destroying their transportation, destroying their communication, disrupting their political um, organization, disrupting their bureaucracy, disrupting their ability to engage in diplomatic connections and alliances with other countries. War requires all of those things, and this is a fairly new kind of a concept, and certainly Grant is um, at the leading edge of that. One of the problems, though, is Grant develops this reputation for not caring so much about the safety and health and lives of his soldiers, which isn't the case. That's not true. Grant, though, recognizes that prior to 1864, the Union Army has been too sort of wishy-washy in the way that they have handled um, Lee in particular, that they would attack, and once that battle was over, the Union Army would sit and kind of lick its wounds and reorganize and regroup and then wait for another battle to happen. Grant says what you need to do is you need to not let up the pressure. You need to constantly push Lee's army from place to place so that Lee doesn't have the opportunity to recover and regroup and resupply. And this earns him a nickname of being a butcher, that he just sends his soldiers into the meat grinder um, and when one battle is over, within the next few days, he sends his soldiers into the next battle. Certainly among the casualty lists of the American Civil War, um, well over half of the most destructive battles in the war happen under Grant's command. But it is one of, maybe not the only way, but it is one way that the North is going to be able to win. And it is going to result in, ultimately, a Union victory. Um, so Grant recognizes that the war needs to change, right? The overall strategy of the war needs to change. And so he pushes the, the Union army in that direction. He's the first Union general who is able to 
um, meet Robert E. Lee kind of toe-to-toe. He's not brilliant in terms of battlefield tactics the way that Lee is, but he is brilliant in understanding the long game of the war and what kinds of things are going to be necessary for the North to prevail. And so this total war idea is partially um, expressed in the actions of some of Grant's subordinates, right? Some of his, um, his second in command. So people like General Sheridan or Sherman, both of whom are given the responsibility of waging war against the South, not just against the Confederate Army. So Sheridan is sent, <clears throat> excuse me, sent into the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley runs along the Appalachian Mountains, kind of along the border between West Virginia and Virginia. Um, it is a, a fantastically fertile and productive area agriculturally. It really was one of the primary food sources for the entire southern population. And Sheridan is given orders to move into the Shenandoah Valley um, and to basically devastate it, right? Make it so that that territory will not be able to provide food material for the Confederate Army or for the Southern population as a whole um, in the hopes that that will weaken the ability for the Confederacy to continue to wage the war. The other um, sort of similar kind of responsibility is given to General Sherman Sherman is sent out of Tennessee. The Union has gotten control of Tennessee pretty early in the war. Um, and so Sherman is sent from Tennessee down through Georgia, marching all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And so he cuts through Georgia and essentially divides the Confederacy from the Carolinas and Virginia on the north and east and then the lower states like Georgia and Florida and Alabama and Mississippi um, on the south and west. The March to the Sea, as it's known, was partially to destroy crops. It was partially to destroy the railroad system that would provide transportation for soldiers or transportation for materials or transportation for messages and communications. Um, and it's basically meant to disrupt Southern society as much as possible. The idea being partially you are eliminating the ability for these areas to continue producing materials that can help the war effort, but also it's partially designed so that as family members living in the path of, of Sherman's march send messages to their boys on the front line, it can hopefully result in desertion, right? Soldiers who normally would be part of Robert E. Lee's army hear from their parents or their sister or their wife that Sherman's army is marching down on them and they decide, I have to go home to try to protect my, my farm. I have to go home to try to protect my shop. It does result in that to some extent, um, but it's it is another example of recognizing that warfare increasingly is going to be a matter of waging war against the entire enemy and not just against the military force of your enemy. He reaches Atlanta uh, in the fall of 1864. He moves down further towards the coast. He reaches Savannah um, in the kind of holiday season, Thanksgiving towards Christmas and then pushes northward into South Carolina. Um, Sherman's March is part of the Southern legend in a lot of ways. It's one of those things like um, for a long time Woodstock was. If you talk to anybody that was alive in 1969, they would tell you they were at Woodstock, um, when that obviously wasn't the case. Same thing with Sherman's March, right? Everybody in the South seems to have a family member whose farm was destroyed or whose business was destroyed by Sherman in his march to the sea. 
Um, and in some cases, these are people who claim this and they lived hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where Sherman even was. Um, it was not the kind of biblical, apocalyptic level of destruction that common descriptions portray it as. It was more reg regimented, more measured. Certainly, it involved um, widespread devastation, but the kind of legendary levels of scorched earth campaign um, really are not, are not reality. But it does speak to this idea that it was a new kind of warfare and it was traumatic enough for enough people that it enters that realm of um, myth beyond just the actual actions that it entailed. And there's a map that shows Sherman's March to the Sea. Um, you can see it, the extreme left part of the map there is Atlanta, where those lines kind of join. And then the march progresses southeast from there, all the way to the coast at Savannah. And then from there it marches up through South Carolina um, and into North Carolina. And the image there that we have is um, Union soldiers tearing up and disabling Confederate railroad tracks. Um, this was a really essential part of this whole process because breaking that method of transportation means that the South is going to be paralyzed or at the very least um, crippled in its ability to um, move materials, to move manpower, to move communications from place to place. Um, and, and especially at a time when that's really essential for them to do, because as they're losing ground in other parts of, of the Confederacy, they need to be able to move people and move materials into areas where they can do more good. And as the railroad lines are, are going to be destroyed, um, those opportunities get less and less and less. And so through 1864, the tide is definitely turning. The only question becomes, um, how long will the Confederacy hold on, and how, um, how quickly will all of these sort of gradual processes actually come together to result in a Union victory. And this becomes even more crucial and more essential because there is a presidential election in 1864. So Lincoln's election of 1860 um, comes right at the, the dawn of the Civil War. The election of 1864 um, is happening right in the midst of it. And at the time, Lincoln was not in any way guaranteed of being reelected. We tend to think of Abraham Lincoln today as being this almost godlike figure, right? That he was universally admired and recognized and that his word sort of carried, um, carried so much weight and carried so much influence that he was just the unquestioned leader of, of the Union cause. And that's not really the case. Um, that kind of mythical status in many ways comes as a direct result of his assassination, right? He gets martyred in April of 1865, basically, and so his reputation expands dramatically as a result. But during his life, even people in his own administration didn't really like him. Either they didn't trust him, they disagreed with his policies, they thought that he was too stupid or too... Um, sort of parochial, right? People treated him as though he was a country bumpkin and, you know, just fell off the turnip truck kind of thing. Um, so he's running for re-election in 1864, and he faces a very legitimate challenge from George McClellan, right? George McClellan, the largely inept commanding officer of the Union forces in 1862, is now dipping his toe into politics, and the Democratic Party nominate McClellan. He has name recognition, 
he manages to spin the narrative in his favor by saying, you know, oh, I could have won the war, but Lincoln tied my hands, or he didn't trust me, or he didn't give me what I needed. McClellan runs on a platform that suggests that he wants to negotiate with the Confederacy. And he never comes right out and says it, but the odds are that this negotiation will be up to and including the possibility of Confederate independence, of actually granting the Confederacy sovereignty and independence to allow it to be a separate standalone country. And this has enough traction among enough voters in the North that McClellan, he was making some pretty significant inroads into Lincoln's chances for re-election. I'm a historian. I'm not going to say, I can't say, oh, well, um, if McClellan had won such and such, or um, if things had gone different, McClellan would have won. There's no way we can know that. But McClellan was doing pretty well up until Sherman starts to send messages back to the North about some of his successes on his march to the sea. In particular, his capture of Atlanta in September of 1864 comes just a few weeks before the election in November of 1864. And so once that kind of news starts to get into the northern public, they start to think, well, we're at the point now where Lincoln has gotten us on the verge of victory in this horrible, horrible war. It would do a disservice to all of our soldiers who had sacrificed themselves in the course of the war if we were to just stop and start negotiating to allow the Confederacy to remain independent. So the tide, as far as the, the political arena is concerned, um, the tide is beginning to turn. Lincoln ends up winning a fairly comfortable victory in 1864. And so he then is given the opportunity, um, for the most part, to see out the completion of, of the war. Um, unfortunately for the country, he will be assassinated right at the end of the war, and so the consequences of that will be severe when it comes to the process of rebuilding the country. But the final stages of the war then um, happen in the very end of 1864 and through the spring of 1865. And this is in many ways under the control of uh, General Grant. So, he is using every trick at his disposal to try to end the Confederate army um, as decisively and as quickly as possible. But this is going to require the use of um, pretty significant numbers of casualties. And ultimately, um, although it is successful, there are still historians that wonder whether there might have been other ways, maybe less bloody ways, um, of reaching this conclusion. It's hard to say. Grant takes a major rail center just outside of Richmond, Virginia, um, in the spring of 1865. And within a few weeks of that, the capital of the Confederacy surrenders Richmond, Virginia. It surrenders on April 2nd, 1865. Lee is still trying to evade Grant's army, and they're moving through Northern Virginia, trying to um, sort of bide their time. Grant manages to um, sort of corner Lee near a place called Appomattox Courthouse. And Lee realizes that the jig is up, right? There's really no way that he can continue to outmaneuver Grant. He can't, he can't ultimately defeat Grant even if he did delay any longer. So he surrenders on April 9th. And Grant 
to his credit, offers Lee and the Confederate Army very generous terms. Um, basically, both sides realize that the better solution is not vengeance and retribution and punishment, but rather just letting all of this stop. Um, the instrument of surrender, as it's known, the actual document that says we surrender our army, um, is signed in a house that's owned by a guy <clears throat> who actually happened to own property where the very first battle of the war, um, Bull Run, was fought um, in June, <clears throat> excuse me, June of 1861. So, one of the many, many odd kind of coincidences um, that, that litter Civil War history. So, Lee surrenders April 9th. This is basically the end of the American Civil War. Um, Lee was by far the most significant military component of the Confederacy. So Lee's surrender means that the war is basically over. The last Confederate military entity um, doesn't actually surrender until November of 1865. That's going to be a Confederate warship, the Shenandoah, and it has actually fled all the way to England um, as the war starts to turn against the Confederacy in the, in the spring and summer of 1865. So the Shenandoah, just as a sort of point of trivia, um, is going to be the, the actual last Confederate military entity to surrender as a result of the war. Lincoln, then, is in the position to um, sort of get the process of Reconstruction started. Um, one of the great tragedies of American history, though, is Lincoln is assassinated uh, less than a week after the Civil War ends, after Lee surrenders. And so the process of Reconstruction is immediately put in the hands of Lincoln's vice president, a man named Andrew Johnson, and Reconstruction then becomes a much more complicated, a much more violent, a much more um, awkward process than it likely would have been had Lincoln remained in the White House. But that's a topic for another day. Um, this is the end of the Civil War material, so make sure that you are reaching out to me if you've got questions about any of that content. Um, make sure that you're looking over the PowerPoint material on Blackboard as well, so that you're getting all of that stuff that um, might add some additional clarification and detail beyond what we went over in the slides. Um, and I hope everybody is doing well. And... Um, I will see you soon.